she gave a little bit of my background. My background with Forest Service goes back quite a bit longer than my getting my degree and my first job with the Forest Service. My dad was Forest Service also, and I spent a very fortunate childhood in traveling the West and spending a lot of my personal recreation time on National Forest System lands. Boundary Waters Canoe Area in, in northern Minnesota, uh, the coastal islands of southeast Alaska, and the beautiful mountains of North Idaho. Uh, went to first and second grade in Grangeville, and my parents still live there, and I went to um, high school in Clarkston, finished high school down there, and when I finished in Clarkston, WSU was close access for me to get a degree in forestry. I had actually started a degree program in fine arts, and some days I can tell you I wish I had stuck with that, because it might have been a, a less controversial life, maybe, but um, my desire to continue in my dad's footsteps as a forester and uh, work for one of the best agencies out there drove me into forestry, and I can say I'm really glad I made that choice so many years ago. So lately, um, just in the last three and a half years, my husband got the um, district ranger job down on the Waxhaw District. That's a big chunk of this country down here on the Clearwater National Forest. And so we moved here, and the forest had an opportunity for me to work on a lands project. Um, and that lands project was this proposed land exchange. And I said, yeah, I think I can do that. I've worked in lands. Um, on and off most of my career, along with recreation and minerals management. And so I waded into this project. And uh, at that point in time, I thought, what a great opportunity to uh, bring these private lands that were uh, previously timber company lands into federal ownership and management. And the reason why that looked attractive to us Why this looked attractive to us is um, reasons long ago identified. In our 1987 forest plan that outlined how we would manage the Clearwater National Forest, that plan actually gave us some direction to try to consolidate inholdings in the forest. And uh, one of those, the only inholdings in the Clearwater National Forest, along with another one that used to be up here, the Beaver Cedar, that exchange was done in 1996, I believe. And uh, so this is the last remnants of that checkerboard country in the Clearwater that uh, we're looking at consolidating. There's, there's administrative reasons why consolidation would be good for us. Um, there are simple things like this creates 250 miles of uh, private and federal landline boundary that needs to be surveyed and maintained over time. Uh, there's a very complex uh, road system in here that's a joint road system, cost shared between, used to be cost shared with Plum Creek when Plum Creek owned it and the Forest Service. And it takes a lot of time and effort and energy to administer those easements and negotiate those things. And uh, it's a good road system for the most part. Uh, and so we could take over uh, those easements over time too and they would just become federal lands and federal roads. So there's administrative reasons, but really uh, the reaching reasons go much further beyond into the natural resource realm. This is the headwaters of the Waxhaw River. You can see the, the Wild and Scenic River Corridor run through the mountains here, down towards uh, Kami, Iacusti, and out past Orfino. This is the headwaters of that, and we have done a lot of federal harvesting on our side, West uh, Plum Creek obviously did a lot of harvesting on their side. And uh, in some instances, our management of these lands differed. We have federal standards that we manage our land to, our forest plan, uh, federal laws and regulations. Plum Creek managed these lands per Idaho State Forest Practices Act regulations. So um, some people like to use some pretty strong terms to talk about how those lands have been managed by the timber companies. And for the most part, they are Idaho State Forest Practice Act standards. They manage them to those standards. I spent a lot of time in Southeast Alaska, and the difference for us up there was um, Native Corporation inholdings in the National Forest. Those came out of a law called ANILCA. And the Native Corporations could manage their lands as they saw fit. They might own miles and miles and miles of timberland that were harvested in a clear-cut fashion. 
And it's quite shocking when you can see miles and miles and miles of clear-cut land when over here on the National Forest side, uh, those clear-cuts are kept to a certain size, between 40 and 100 acres, and it just looks different on the landscape. Similar up here, uh, the Idaho State Forest Practices Act would allow Plum Creek uh, at that time to harvest all of their portion. They had to meet riparian, um, setbacks and things like that. So when you drive up here, it, it looks like it's been harvested. It's been managed heavily by the timber company. And we've got all those road systems, and for us, the interest is in part to try to start some restoration on this, on this beautiful landscape up here in, uh, in the mountains, to start to restore some of that landscape. Um, that would be restoration efforts that would be to a different standard than the State Practices Act. Our primary species of interest up there are two threatened and endangered fish species. And uh, this is considered in a lynx, um, lynx habitat. Um, so a lot of other things going on up here. There's the um, Nest Curse Trail. The Lewis and Clark Trail runs through checkerboard country too. So those are all things that interested us in consolidation. So as a, a lands person with the Forest Service, we have um, three ways that we can acquire lands into federal ownership. People can donate lands to us. You might scratch your head and say why, but it, people do. They, they have a love for a piece of land, been in their family a long time, might abut national forest land, and they might decide that they want to donate it to the public uh, to be held um, for public uses. So donation is one way we can acquire lands. We can purchase lands. We have a fund called the Land and Water Conservation Act that funds a certain amount of purchase in the United States <coughs> annually that federal agencies can compete for those fundings. The, the funds for those um, come from offshore oil and gas leases and other kinds of recreational taxes like on boat gas and things like that. And uh, so that's our primary means of purchasing would be uh, by trying to acquire money through Land and Water Conservation Fund. And then we can also do an exchange. And so when we were approached back in uh, April 2006 by Western Pacific, uh, exchange is what we, what the tool that we really had available to us. We could do an exchange. And at that time, we identified lands on the three North Idaho forests that we thought uh, were potential for exchange. There are. Um, about 1,400 acres, I think, I don't remember off the top of my head, up on the Idaho Panhandle National Forest. Uh, primarily those parcels are isolated parcels. They're um, less than 640 acres, and they're little isolated pieces of land surrounded by private ownership. Um, then the Nespers National Forest, uh, we identified lands around the Elk City Township. Um, this map isn't the greatest. But um, you can see, here's all the green national forest out here. Here's the checkerboard land that we're trying to acquire. This little uh, township out here in the middle of the Nespers National Forest, uh, Elk City sits right in the middle of it. Um, at, that, at the point that we came out with our proposal, we worked closely with uh, county commissioners in Idaho County, and they said, how about you identify some lands around the township out here? Elk City used to be a uh, little community based on, in part on timber in the, the timber industry, and they had lost their mill in. And I think the county commissioner uh, that proposed that at the time was thinking this would be an opportunity to get some lands in private ownership in Idaho County. These lands, for the most part, are in Idaho County that would be going to public lands, and down here they could actually see the potential for some of the federal lands going private to offset the loss of taxes from this land. So they proposed some lands that we try to put on the map down here. And then, um, and then out on um, the Palouse and the North Fork districts of the Clearwater, we have the rest of the lands that we're considering for exchange. Some of them are remote, though they are connected to the National Forest. They are remote parcels that are adjacent uh, to other National Forest lands. Some of them are completely isolated by other private lands. And so for the most part, it's little bits and pieces that we try to identify. Um, in our original proposal, we identified 28,000 acres of federal land, knowing that we probably wouldn't need that much, but knowing that through our public participation process, NEPA, that 
the document that we've just done, that some of those lands would, would drop out of the exchange. So right now, the most lands we have proposed currently are in alternative B, and there's about 18,000 acres of federal land proposed for exchange in alternative B, um, still on those three national forests. So we went from 28,000 acres down to 18, and we dropped lands off of all three national forests. And uh, we looked at all of our original public scoping comments and uh, looked at the areas of real concern. And uh, like out in Elk City, we dropped lands that were in the American River drainage area. And there was a lot of concern over those lands leaving federal ownership for the same reasons we were trying to get these into federal ownership. The same two threatened and endangered fish species. So those lands are no longer being considered. We had some parcels that by the Potlatch River ran through. Those parcels were dropped out. And um, other, other bits and pieces, a lot around Elk River. The community of Elk River was very concerned about the amount of federal lands that could potentially leave ownership because they see their new niche as trying to entice people to come into Elk River to recreate on all those public lands surrounding Elk River. So, our alternative B in the um, proposal is called the Modified Proposed Action, 18,000 acres, uh, potentially exchanged for the 40,000 acres. We think that might still be enough acreage, federal acreage, to give us a value-to-value -value land exchange. Uh, the values of the land have to be equal, and that's based on an appraisal, and the appraisal will probably be started here in the next couple months. And, um, so that's the modified proposed act, um, action in the, in the draft environmental impact statement. Um, then we have alternative C. It drops uh, the federal acreage to about 14,000 acres. We dropped additional lands off the map up near Elk River. Another 4,000 uh, 4, acres come off the map for alternative C. That alternative we think is below what's considered an equal value exchange. And so that would be combined with a purchase portion. That purchase portion, we would still try to acquire funding from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And um, two years ago, we put in a proposal to that fund, and we asked for $10 million at that point in time. And they, um, they in a draft president's budget for the, this fiscal year, 2011, they identified $2 million for us to try to purchase some of this land up here. Now, we hope to get it. We really want to get it. We want to start that purchase. However, we don't have a past federal budget yet. And until we have gotten beyond our continuing resolution and get a federal budget, we don't know if that, that money will still be there for us. Um, and if it is in that amount, we're not, we don't know. So we're waiting for the budget to pass. That's alternative C, and alternative C, as soon as we make a final decision on this document, which could be next fall, uh, we'll publish a final document and a record of decision that will document the decision makers, whatever he decides, whichever alternative he decides. But in the meantime, we're taking public comments on all of our ideas and all of our information in this document. Um, alternative D in this document is our four supervisors preferred alternative. It is considering the same 14,000 acres of federal land for exchange as in alternative C, uh, but it would be kind of tipped on its head a little bit in an effort to have a little bit more time to try to acquire funding from various places, whatever that might be. So it's considered a, a phased exchange and purchase. It would happen over the course of several years, and the uh, goal for that alternative would be to try to maximize the federal purchase part and minimize the federal exchange part. And that would uh, perhaps give people time to um, help us come up with creative ways and means to fund a purchase of the lands. So um, if you're interested in commenting, comments are due February 23rd to me down in Kamiai. Uh, this is available on the internet, and there's CDs if anybody's interested in getting a, a compact disc or a hard copy from me. Uh, catch me at the end of the meeting and I'll put your name on a list and go home and mail one off to you. 
I'm thinking I might be out of time. Yeah. <coughs>